أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم استغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه وخاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيد الأولين والآخرين شفيع المزنين رحمة للعالمين محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذا هديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوحاب السلام عليكم أيها الأخوة والأخوة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله نحن 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 um, just to give a short summary of what we discussed yesterday, we basically tried to lay out the scene of what kind of injustices are happening in the world to Islam, but also the way in which this is discussed in the media and in our daily language. And what we concluded was that when Islam is attacked as a terrorist religion, or as a barbaric religion, it's very important to understand the reasons given by media or by politicians. And we said that, of course, some of the things are false. But some other things, which they may accuse us of, our way of looking at the world, or I gave the example of slavery, that this has not been banned, for example, we have to reinvestigate how we are understanding our religion and what kind of project we want for the next 50 to 100 years. Where do we want Muslims to be in the next century, for example? How do we want people to understand Islam? This is all in our hands. This has got nothing to do with non-Muslims or media or Western governments. This is about us. Do we want to be leaders in knowledge? Do we want people to look at us and say, we want to be like Muslims? We want to be like these Muslims who are looking after people in society. So when we talk about Islam, and we're talking about injustices done to it, we have to be very honest with ourselves. And the way in which all of this is framed, we said, is in human rights. Because the language is always used, that I, you know, Islam is terrorist, or women don't have rights, etc. So we have to understand what human rights are. And we said that human rights basically are rights which are innate within all of us. I have a right to life. I have a right of free speech. I have a right to educate myself. I have a right to set up a family. And nobody has a right, nobody has a right to take away these things from me. No country, no religion, no person here. This, these, these are things which I demand. Now hopefully, we are all in agreement with that. Whether we are Muslim or non-Muslim, all of us would say yes, you know, I would like a right to life. I would like a right to set up my family. And maybe this is the start of the conversation. Because in these lectures, I don't just want to state to you the problem. I want to give you, according to my small research, some solutions. The way in which we can respond to the accusations in the media, but also the way in which we can change the conversation about Islam in the media. We don't want to see on a day-to-day -day basis that Islam is a backward religion, that Muslims cannot contribute to society. We want a new conversation. We want a different conversation. One that is positive, one that is proactive, and one that carries the spirit of Al Hussein alayhi salam. 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 So just forgive me if maybe the first three or four lectures are a bit technical, you know, I'm going into human rights. After the fourth lecture, Inshallah, we'll be dealing more with kind of spirituality. But I think it's important to discuss these issues because I don't find that we will have any other platform. You know, Muharram gives the best platform. So I'm trying to be hopefully as simple as possible. So forgive me if, you know, one or two terms are, are technical. Now, what I want to do in this lecture is maybe offer some solutions. Now, I'm going to give you more solutions in these lectures, but I want to start with this lecture. And I want to begin with the letter of Hussein alayhi salam. Now, this letter, which I'm going to just read some parts to you, was a letter written to Muawiyah. And the reason that Al-Hussein alayhi salam wrote this letter 
is because Muawiyah wrote a letter to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, kind of criticizing Hussein alayhi salam, and also Muawiyah was giving threats to Hussein alayhi salam. So he was trying to scare Hussein. Now the reason why I'm starting with this is although usually we talk about Hussein standing firm against Yazid ibn Muawiyah, we know that after Al Hassan al Islam passed away, it was the responsibility of Hussein to uphold the pact which Al Hassan al Islam started with Muawiyah. It wasn't that suddenly Hussein al Islam came on the scene and he was very bold and he says, I'm going to make a stand. No, he respected the pact that Al Hassan al Islam initiated with Muawiyah in order that there would be some semblance of peace in society. Now, so when Muawiyah started to criticize Hussein al-Islam. This is what Hussein wrote to Muawiyah. These are just some parts. He said, O oh Muawiyah, you know, you have threatened me, but are you not the murderer of Hujr ibn Adi and his chaste companions who opposed injustice and considered innovations to be evil? They did not pay heed to any accusations in the way of Allah. Had you O Muawiyah, not made promises and oaths to them? Had you not assured them that you will not arrest them? Because, you know, one of the parts of the pact was that the Shia should be protected. Okay, that the people who followed Hassan alayhi salam, they should be protected. And that you will not trouble them. Despite such oaths and promises, have you not put them to death? So now look how he's criticizing Muawiyah. He's saying, Muawiyah, you made some promises that the followers of the Ahlul Bayt Muslim, should not be touched. That, you know, they should not be killed, they should not be harassed. So now he's criticizing the policy of Muawiyah. Another part of the letter. You have written, O Muawiyah, that I must sit quiet for the sake of my life and the safety of Muhammad's Ummah. And that I must not sow the seeds of dissension and corruption in the society. But I do not consider anything more corrupt for this Ummah than your tyrannical rule. I consider jihad against you to be the best and the most meritorious thing for me and for Muhammad's Ummah. If I wage a holy war against you, it shall be the best means of seeking nearness to Allah. If not, then I seek forgiveness from Allah. And I shall pray to Allah for guidance in my affairs. So now here, you know, Muawiyah is trying to scare Hussein a.s. But Hussein a.s. is not giving in. He's saying, I have to speak out and act against your tyrannical rule. And not only that, I always ask guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he also mentioned this kind of statement, you know, I always rely or ask guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He mentions this statement to Muhammad ibn Hanafi as well. So he's always, you know, he's not certain. He's, he's courageous. He wants to act against Muawiyah and Yazid, but he's always asking Allah for guidance. That is the mark of humility. That is the mark of sincerity. It's like, you know, I'm giving you this lecture. Now, I'm being sincere about it as much as possible, but I'm not certain about it. I'm not claiming that whatever small solutions and an analysis that I'm giving you, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm giving you my humble research. In the same way, Hussein a.s., when we want to follow Hussein a.s., we have to follow his humility. He's always understanding or measuring his actions and trying to act in a way that Allah would be pleased with. And then he says, You, O Muawiyah, have killed those with whom you have made treaties, promises and oaths. And you have killed them when they neither had any intention of waging a war against you, nor had they committed murder. You shed their blood only because they related our <coughs> merits, that is the Ahlul Bayt's merits, and were aware of the greatness of our rights. Because of course Muawiyah and Yazid usurped uh, Hassan's rights and Hussein alayhi rights. Although it was possible that natural death would have occurred to them or to you even before their uprising to reach to a conclusion. Why have I read some of these paragraphs of the letter out which was recorded in Ayyan Shia? 
Because when you look at Hussein alayhi salam, one thing that we have to admire is his courage in speaking out against injustice. How many of us and how many of our scholars, how many of our community members have the courage to say, this is wrong in the society. And when I say society, I mean Muslim society and non-Muslim society. I mean our Muslim leaders and also mean non-Muslim leaders. Look at the courage of Hussein alayhi salam. Hussein could be killed at any moment. And yet he's writing this letter to Muawiyah. And not only is he speaking out, but he is criticizing Muawiyah's policies. He's saying, didn't you do this? Didn't you do this? Didn't you do this? That's why I began lecture one with, we have to understand strategies or trends or ideas of injustice in the society. Whether these result from non-Muslims, whether these result from Muslims, whether these result from human rights, or our own understanding of fiqh and Islam. We have to be very honest with ourselves. Can we proclaim today that we have understood Islam correctly, 100%? Can we say that? What is the point of doing dua for 12th Imam? Why do we do it? We always pray, and I pray today that inshallah Allah uh, hastens the reprints of our 12th Imam, of course. Why do we say that? Because we believe that we have not understood Islam correctly. We would like a savior to come and show us the way. Now it is another thing, it is another lecture which we need to say, well, what is the philosophy of 12th Imam? How do we recreate the conditions for justice that if the 12th Imam were to suddenly come today, would he be happy with the community? Would we understand the vision of the 12th Imam? This is another lecture. But the reason why we pray for 12th Imam is because we believe we are not perfect. The reason why a mushtahid claims that this is my ishtihad is because he believes there is a doubt there. He is not proclaiming that what he is saying is Allah's will. So, when we talk about Hussein alayhi salam, Hussein alayhi salam is understanding what is happening in his society and he's being very courageous to call out those injustices that are happening, whether by any type of dictator or in trending society. The second thing is that he is humble enough to say, I ask Allah for guidance. So I know that, of course, we might understand Islam in a particular way, you and I. You might agree some things with me, you might disagree. This is normal, it's good to have healthy debate. But if an Imam is being so humble, that every step of the way to Karbala, he's saying, Oh Allah, guide me. I have trust in you. Who are we today to say, I am absolutely certain about my understanding of Islam? Right. We have, you know, this is Al Hussein al Islam talking. We have to learn from his humility. And the last thing is that he criticizes Muawiyah for making promises and oaths which he doesn't keep. Again, this is very relevant in terms of human rights. Because today, America makes a pact or a promise, you know, we see this, the same thing in UK. A politician makes a promise. Okay? Now, we know that generally speaking, politicians are not to be trusted. Because they always go back on their promise. Right? This is very normal. We make a promise in order to get votes. He is criticizing Muawiyah for exactly the same thing. You made this promise and you broke it. Making a promise is so important. Because that tells you the value of a human being. If a person, any person in the community, or any person in the government, cannot make that promise or uphold that promise, what value is he or she? Trustworthiness in, and sincerity is found in promises. So when we talk about you know, trying to uh, develop Islam, trying to protect Muslims, trying to make a better society, it comes down to our sincerity and promises. So how do we begin this process? This is now the fundamental question. If we all agree, we want to make a better society, despite differences that are between Islam and so-called West, despite the attacks from the media, surely there is common ground, isn't there? We hope, and hopefully you agree with me, hopefully, that we all agree, as I said, we want a right to life, a right to education. We agree on these things. We want a right to set up this center. 
if we agree on these things, we, you know, we want to be able to respect each other despite our different cultures and races, etc. If we agree on this, then there is more common ground and similarity between this so-called division that is set up between Islam and the West. There has to be common ground. <coughs> After all, we are all human beings at the end of the day. So we have to search for that common ground. And that's the conversation that we have to have with people that perhaps are scared of Islam or against Islam. And even for ourselves, the way we look at Islam we want to find common ground and make people believe and see that this religion is a religion of humanity and a religion of development and a religion of progress. Wasn't that our dear prophet's vision? When he says, don't bury female babies, don't treat women like that, respect your women, he had a vision of progress. So when Hussein al-Islam says, I want to rectify the affairs of my grandfather and my father, he's saying, where did that society go that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon, peace be upon him, was creating? Where has that society gone that we have regressed? Why were the Kufans easily bribed? Or why were they not courageous enough to answer Hussein al-Islam's call? What happened in that short space of years? You can imagine that the, the society the Prophet built, to the extent that people said, yes, we will follow you, but then they decided not to follow you. What about Muslims today? Are we courageous enough to do Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahl al -Murka? Now, of course, there are Iranians in the audience and they know their history better than me. Um, there are elders here in the audience who may have lived during the time of Ayatollah Khomeini, may Allah elevate his stations. But when I, you know, as a, as a young person, when I look at the, that, 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 that period in history, what I have noticed is that even the courage of Ayatollah Khomeini was criticized, criticized in his own time. Scholars were not very sure that somebody should speak out against the Shah. I mean, you can correct me if I'm, not, if, if I'm wrong. People were unsure. Not everybody was supporting Ayatollah Khomeini. Even today, this debate still rages on. So, you know, of, of course, we can always say, well, what kind of political model uh, a, a, a state should have? What political model should an, uh, should an ummah have? Yes. But surely, we should not be afraid to do Amr al-Ma'roof and Ahl al-Munkar. Surely. This is the injunction of the Qur'an. And even when you look at hadith compilations like Gural al-Hikam, Imam al-Islam says that Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahl al-Munkar is the foundation of religion. Exhorting people to do good and prohibiting that which is bad surely is the lifeblood of Islam. Whichever way we do it. We can't disagree on that, surely. So if we want to make, for example, our interpretation of Islam better, if we want to improve the lives of Muslims, if we, want, if we don't want to see poor Muslims or poor human beings generally, then we have to believe in this kind of message, which is the message of Hussein al-Islam. So where do we start? Yesterday we discussed human rights. And we said that human rights are basically something which human, human beings demand. Now, it's okay saying that, and it's okay having legislation, it's okay government saying that, it's okay our scholars saying, look, Islam is a wonderful religion, the, the prophet wanted to preach akhlaq, etc. It's one thing to say that, but it's another thing to practice it. We now have to go behind human rights, behind fiqh, and this becomes a very important area, something I think which is not discussed. The reason I'm telling you this is, if we think that uh, for example, we have the Prophet or we have Hussein al-Islam. Or we have a fatawa and the fatawa is guiding us, we have fiqh which is guiding us, or we have human rights in the world that is guiding us. If we think that law, that our fatawa, that human rights, operates in a vacuum, that, okay, look, a mushtahid has derived a law. A government has derived a law which is a benefit for the American society. If we think that laws just are there, and there is no politics behind them, there is no social discussion, there is no values, or there is no worldview, then we have a very naive and narrow view of what law is. Law and guidance and rights are made on the basis of how society feels, of how society looks at each other. Today, for example, 
when you look at the way that we may look at other religions, all right? Jews, Christians, Hindus, other groups of non-Muslims. The rights that we give them, or the way that we look at them, and you say, okay, a rule has come about a Jew and a Christian, maybe eating from them, maybe behaving with them. It's not that the law is just derived there from Quran and Sunnah. The law is based on a mushtahid's experience and perspective and his interaction with a fellow non-Muslim. Today, if Britain and America says that every person in this society has a right to education, every person has a right to have freedom of association and assembly, like this center. We can set up this center in Seattle, for example. It's because they have gone through an experience where they perhaps want to manage diversity and culture. Can you imagine if every day or every month, for example, a Muslim petitions to the government, so, you know, we want to set up this center, and they say no. We don't like Muslims, and, you know, we have our particular values. What kind of chaos, chaos would there be in society? People would not even be able to live or practice their religion freely. Don't we see this in Saudi Arabia? Don't we see this in Bahrain? And there are many reports. In Bahrain, for example, I forget the, the name of the person uh, who was put in jail, etc., for this, or was criticized for this. But if you just Twitter, and you go on Facebook and you criticize the Bahraini government, the Bahraini government will put you in jail. The Bahraini government will crack down on any kind of media that you start to initiate, which is not part of the government. Now, we as Muslims are seeing this in our own Muslim countries. So when I'm kind of kindly informing you that when a law is derived, a law is derived on the basis of a government's experience of society, or a mushtahid's experience of society, or generally our experience of society. Law does not operate in a vacuum. It operates on the basis of people's experience with each other. Today, we are living, for example, or I'm from UK, but here I'm in Seattle. The way that we are interacting with each other, we have different cultures in the center, or the way that you speak to your work colleague, is based on your natural experiences of society. The society is molding you, and we are also molding society. This is how laws originate, on the basis of our experience. So, the reason I just said this scene for you, is because when you look at Karbala, what was the spirit of Karbala? If Hussain was to make a law today, okay? What kind of law would he make to increase our respect for each other? Just think about that question. What kind of law would he make? Just think about it. In his journey, what kind of people joined him? Christians joined him. Wahab, Haniya and Kamar were Christians. Hor joined him. What kind of religion, what kind of theology did Hor have? We know the very famous episode, and such a beautiful and spiritual episode. Uh, Sheikh Mufid reports this episode in Kitab al -Ishad. When Hur comes to Hussein al -Islam, he says, Oh Hussein, oh my master, can you ever forgive me for what I have done? I was the one that stopped you in your journey. And this reflection of Hur came about because before he came to Hussein he told, I think, uh, one of the soldiers or, or one of the commanding officers in that army, he says, I find myself between heaven and hell. And then he goes to Hussein after that reflection. And he goes to Hussein and he says, can you ever forgive me? And what is Hussein's response? This is so beautiful. Hussein our dear master, who we call master today, say, says, I forgive you and Allah forgives you. Finish. That's, that's the end of the episode. I forgive you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. And they embrace. And Hur joins Hussein al Islam's side. Now I've given you two simple examples. I've given you Wahab, Haniya, and Kamar, who are Christians, reportedly Christians. And the example of Hur. And we don't know the theology of Hur and, and whatever. But he made a reflection. He decided that Hussein's cause was something worthy. Maybe, of course, he had a, 
he had a spark that he wants to now think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and move towards God and he, he joined the camp. So my question, going back to the question, which is, what law would Hussein al-Islam make in order to manage diversity? In order for us to respect each other? Would he not look at the heart of people and say, this person wants to do good, so I should encourage it. Did he look at the religion of Hur? Did he look at the religion of Wahab, Hani and Kamar? Do you think that he started to say, right, I've got to convert these people now. You know? I have to now analyze how they pray. What do they pray? Do you think he posed these questions? At least in the reports that we have with, uh, about Karbala, he didn't ask these questions. At least from what I have seen. He never asked these questions. Now look at us, okay? Look at how we are looking at other people, okay? As Muslims and also non-Muslims, I'm being objective as much as possible. We, you know, as Shias, we don't like people calling us kafir, yes? We don't like people calling us mushrik. We always complain about it, don't we? We say, oh, Wahhabis are criticizing Shias, and they are attacking us, and they are killing us. Why can't we go on ziyarat and do ziyarat peacefully? Why always do we have to hear that we are worshipping Imam Ali and Imam Hussain Islam? Yes? This is always what we say. We say, why, why are they calling us kafir? We love Ali ibn Abi Talib We believe he's a successor of the Prophet. No problem. So why is it that they're calling us these things? Now, it doesn't matter the reasons, but they're attacking us with these things. And we don't, like, we don't like to be called this. Hopefully you agree. We don't like to be insulted in this manner. But, don't we say that some non-Muslims are Najis? We call a Hindu Najis. We call some groups of non-Muslims Najis. We say, you know, you are impure. Don't we say that? Now, if we are saying that, and at the same time, we don't like to be insulted, let us think for one second. We are already putting labels on some non-Muslims. How would they feel? You know, imagine some non-Muslim sitting here and I'm, I'm giving you a fake rule, or I'm discussing this, how would they feel? They would leave. Would you, do you think that any human being likes to be disrespected in that manner? We don't like to be disrespected as Shias. And then we are also giving those labels to non-Muslims. As I said, what would Hussein al-Islam do? Don't we think that the project and the mission and the vision of Karbala was beyond all of this? It was there to bind people on the basis of goodness and godliness. He, he wants to do good, I'm going to encourage him. Okay, whatever his beliefs, whatever his culture. But I will encourage the good out of him. Wasn't that Hussein al-Islam's aim in Khur? He did not drive Khur away. He did not try to belittle Khur. He encouraged Khur and maximi maximized his potential. Are we maximizing the potential of other people in society. Do you think we are doing that? Are we using Hussein's message in that way? Or are we making labels to people? And those labels drive people away from Islam. Now that's our responsibility. When you look at, for example, the non-Muslim side, and of course not all non-Muslims are the same, but those people that criticize Islam perhaps uh, in a false way, when they are saying that all, all Muslims are barbaric, that all women, for example, are backward when they wear hijab. Of course that is false. They are doing a dhulm on us as well. Because they now are making us feel belittled. It's nobody's right to go and insult us like this. Where we have to meet in the common ground is to say, well look, you don't have a right to insult us in this way. You have no right to call us terrorist. Okay, few people are, are committing bad deeds, yes. But you don't call the whole religion like this. But at the same time, we have to be bigger. If Hussein al-Islam is part of our heritage, and he is our treasure, then we have to use him. Hussein al-Islam never insulted the people in Yazid's camp. Did he? He tried to encourage goodness out of them. Now I'm going to give you an example of this as well. <coughs> the point is, that if truly we want to make Hussein al-Islam's mission alive, then we have to go back to his values. And sometimes, as I said, we are clouded by very, very narrow and petty things. But the greatness of Hussein was that he was able to rise above that. So. <laughs>
Quran. So, the point that I want to make is that when we look at laws and rights and all of these things, remember, it's people's experience of each other. It's as simple as that. If, if you know, a, a mushtahid or any, you know, community leader or, or, for example, you invite a non-Muslim to the center and you have a conversation with them, his perception of Islam may change and, and it will change for the better. People's experience and the conversation, conversation that you have with them goes a long way. The second thing, when you talk about human rights and laws and you say you want to make a better society, laws themselves cannot make a better society. You can't. So if, for example, you know, we have many human rights legislation today, many. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Human Rights Act 1998, and many examples. And all of them will tell you the same thing. You know, you have a right to life and right to education, all these things, right not to be enslaved. This is very wonderful. We have it in writing. Many Muslim countries are signatories, by the way, of these, of these conventions. <laughs> but they go about and infringe the rights. What law and fiqh and, and our interpretation of Islam, so I'm, I'm being objective, I'm talking about Muslim and non-Muslim together. What we all need are institutions. And this is what we discussed uh, in Fajr today as well, so it was relevant. Um, we also need institutions and organizations to help give effect to our law. So for example, if we really believe that all human beings should be respected, right? and we believe nobody has the right to be called Najis or Kafir and all of these things, then we need institutions that help promote this. So now, I'll ask you a question. How many institutions in the Muslim world do we have that are working on interfaith dialogue, on responding to the media, and on changing this conversation of Mushrik and Kafir in the world? How many do we have in the Muslim world? I know maybe one in the United Kingdom, maybe there is one or two elsewhere. That's nowhere near enough. We need tens, twenty, thirty, hundreds of these institutions all around the world in order that they can change people's mindsets. Do we invest money in these institutions? Where is the Muslim mentality and the Muslim money going? Where is it going? Most of our conversation, as you and I know, every Ramadan will fight over moon. This is, a, this is a fact now. So this is our intellectual level. We are so worried. We are so worried when we will do Eid. We can't even unite on that. You know, in uh, a few months ago, I don't know if this, this may have happened here, but there was uh, an opportunity for Muslims to actually have one Eid day in the whole calendar in the United Kingdom. Because there was a, a discussion with the government, and the government was offering that government is saying, we'll give you one day where you can take a day of work. Now, the Muslims have said, look, alhamdulillah, you know, let's take advantage of this peti petition. I never signed the petition, by the way, because we were not mature enough, first of all, to come to an understanding ourselves that we're going to select one day. What's the point of signing the petition? What was the point? It's going to fall anyway, because the government will say, these Muslims can't even make a proper decision together. So, you know, it's not that everyone is bad and all non-Muslims are bad. We can work together all the time. But we have to be mature. Now, if we want to have a conversation like that, of having one Eid and, you know, people recognize what Eid is, and we give it... Imagine if we had one public holiday like that in American and, and British calendar. Imagine the universal message that we could give out. Imagine the impact that we could have. Wasn't this the purpose of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Hajj? The point of the khutbah, especially on those days, especially when the Prophet was doing it, was to give a message to the community. And we can't even do that, unfortunately. So, where is our time going? Where is our money going? We're investing money in these conversations, we're investing money in committees which want to investigate when to do Eid. What's the point of that? You know, okay, this debate will continue going, I, I pray inshallah it stops. Because the problem is Muslims are being killed. The problem is we are being criticized for being kafir. This is the thing that's dominating everything. We have to change that. And for that, we have to build institutions that are going to give us guidance on these things. That's the responsibility of ulama, professionals, community leaders, all of us to work together. If we can do that, then law will be something positive, not something negative. The third thing is that 
as I mentioned at the start, our interpretation of Islam will always change. You know, uh, 50 years ago some fatwas were different, and today they are different. In another 50 years, they'll be different. To, you know, tomorrow you might have a different model, today of Wilayat al another, maybe in 50 years somebody will come up with something else, who knows what will happen. This is natural human development. So we have to always be open to change. The project of Hussein al-Islam was for us to develop that kind of interpretation that always we are finding out what is the goodwill of human beings. How can we always live together? How can we make sure injustice is prevented? And here, Muslims and non-Muslims are not perfect. We are not perfect. We are in the same boat here. I know that we say we have Hussein al-Islam and the Prophet and we are, you know, this is our standard response. Somebody says we're an extremist religion, we will say, no, 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 we are peaceful. You know, we are, we are, we always say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we are a merciful religion. But at the same time, we have to practice it and implement it. So for example, we have one human rights legislation in the whole of the Muslim world. It's called the Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, 1990. This is our only human rights legislation, just to let you know. The Western kind of legislation, the Western International Community has many human rights legislation. As I said, it doesn't mean it's perfect, they still uh, breach it. But still, we have one. We have one. And if you ever read that, maybe in a majalis, if I have time, I'll explain that. If you go on the internet and you search that legislation, put Cairo Declaration of Human Rights, you will see that that legislation is so poor that in that, you know what they say in the preamble? They say, God has blessed the Muslim Ummah with the best civilization. And we recognize that other civilizations are suffering from material problems and material illnesses. So we, the Muslim civilization, enact this legislation to guide the rest of the world. How many of us have the latest iPhone? And, and how big is our TV in our home? How many of us have the latest iPhone? We pull it out now, we have the best iPhone. What is this legislation? Who do we think that we are that we can guide other people like that? Now, there are some parts of the legislation which are good. I'm not criticizing completely. But even then, there is no far-sighted vision of how we can guide people. Hussein was trying to guide people. He tried to guide people by showing mercy to people, by trying to encourage the goodness. If you look at Western states, as I said, they are not perfect either. I want to give you an example of this, okay? Um, President Roosevelt rejected the appeal for blacks and injustices which were done against them in the United Nations Human Rights Commission, and this was after the Second World War, although the Soviets actually tried to adopt human rights in their agenda. This allowed America to talk about the Soviets in a very bad way, but not talk about the, the way that America was treating blacks during that time. Okay? So when we talk about human rights progression, it's not that rights progress, not necessarily. If truly, and giving an example of that, of that time, I can give an example of Britain as well, if truly America believed in the civil rights of the blacks, why did it take so long? Because there was politics involved. There's always politics involved with law. Always. Right? So remember that even in Western states, they could have, you know, the civil rights movement could be more advanced today had America adopted at that time. But it was relevant for them not to say, so they could also criticize Soviets. In the 1950s, human rights was seen as something communist, by the way, just to let you know. And this information I'm giving you is by a professor called Kostas Duzinac, who's at Birkbeck University in London. He has a a book called uh, Human Rights and Empire, which I recommend you to read. It's a wonderful book. It will tell you all about the way human rights is functioning. And what he says, he says that it took 26 years for the United States to ratify, that means kind of accept the civil and political rights covenant, 40 years to accept the Genocide Convention, and 28 years for the Convention Against Racial Discrimination. Congress has not ratified, however, the Economic and Social Rights Covenant, the Convention Banning Discrimination Against Women, and the U.S. is the only country, uh, along with Somalia, uh, that has not ratified or accepted the Convention on the Rights of Children. Okay? No country is perfect. No system is perfect. No Muslim country is perfect. Our fiqh is not perfect. 
I gave the example that if our fiqh is labeling people, but yet the message of Hussein al -Islam was to encourage people to be part of his family, surely we are far away from the message of Hussein al -Islam. Surely even non-Muslim countries are far away from what they profess. We'll, you know, if we say that we are in the same boat, then we can have a conversation with each other. But if we say we are superior to each other, then we can't have a conversation with each other. Salwa. <laughs> there is one final example I want to give you before the maktal, okay? Um, today, uh, one of the commentators or one of the scholars of human rights, uh, Tom Farah, has actually said that human rights is about democratic capitalism and its enemies. That means, if you are a capitalist, wonderful. But if you are against capitalism, and if you are against democracy, and if you are against the language of human rights that we believe in, then you are our enemy. Okay? Now, why have I said this? I don't believe that whatever United Kingdom or US or other countries are doing is perfect. I don't. Because we, we can see it. You can't go and invade a country for oil, for example, in Iraq, and then say we believe in human rights. You can't do that. You can't bomb children in villages and, and say we believe in human rights. What is happening, which we have to be very careful of, is when we talk about human rights, and we all believe in it, say, yeah, right to life, etc. Now what is happening is human rights are used as a tool to justify political agendas, to justify wars, to, just, to justify invasions. So human rights, you know, it's very simple. You look at, you know, speeches of George Bush or Tony Blair or Obama or whatever, always you say, we are there to liberate people. We are there to give rights to people. We are there to educate people. We are there to make sure that there's no suffering in that country. All of these are human rights terms. So human rights now is not something that is part of human beings. Human rights is an instrument only. An instrument for political gain. And we have to call that. We have to say that. We have to be courageous enough to say that and research it. Just as Hussein alayhi salam criticized Muawiyah for killing the companions of Hassan al-Islam, for saying that this policy is wrong, we have to have the courage to do that and the knowledge to do that as well. Okay? If we have the knowledge to do that, then we are able to change the conversation again. But what about Muslims? Do we behave like that? Do we say, it's either my way or the highway? Do you think we are like that? My humble reflection is in some respects we are like that. Why? Today, just because I do taqlid of a different marja, somebody will attack me. Oh no, why are you doing taqlid of this marja? Why? It, it's my freedom to do it. I can choose whoever I want to do. So why is it that other people are getting angry about it? Number two, if other people simply have a different interpretation of Islam, even within the Shia religion, they have a different you know, interpretation of the fiqh because they live in the western country and the fiqh in the eastern country is different. Okay, fine. This is ijtihad. Hosa should develop everywhere. So why are people against other people? Why should we pit a scholar against another scholar? Why should I show hatred to my fellow brother and sister? Why? What, where has this come from? This has got nothing to do with Islam. And I want to give you proof of this, okay? Because this goes on in our community all the time. Of course, it even goes in the Sunni world. Oh, you are Shia, oh, you are Sunni, so we'll show some hatred. This has got nothing at all to do with the Prophet, to do with Imam Ali, to do with Imam Hassan, to do with Imam Hassan Islam. And the, 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 the quote that I want to give you is from Hussein Alayhisalam himself. This is reported in Kitab al Irshad and it is reco uh, recorded in Tariq al Tabri as well. There was an incident on the way to Karbala, which is very interesting. There was a caravan that was going to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Now, that caravan had very beautiful uh, cloaks and other goods which were gifts that was sent to Yazid ibn Muawiyah uh, by some, you know, uh, Umayyad governor, okay? Now, in that caravan, there were some poor people or servants that were carrying these cloaks to Yazid. Uh, the caravan crossed the path of Hussein al-Islam, all right? Now, Hussein al-Islam stopped the caravan. 
And he said, you know, where are you going? What is happening? They said, you know, we're going to Yazid. He found out that these cloaks came from Yemen. And these goods came from Yemen. And these cloaks and goods were from poor people, actually. They were actually the goods and the possessions of poor people. So he actually repossessed those goods in order to give it back to poor people. So he says, look, I'm sorry, I can't allow you to give these goods to Yazid because you have unlawfully taken them. Or, and or, the poor people are more deserving of this. You cannot exploit people in this way. So he stopped the caravan. So this is very courageous of Hussein al-Islam. So, and he gives a legitimate reason. Now, the poor people say, but you know, we have to give, we have to go to Yazid, what's going to happen? Now, this is his response. He says, look, I have done this, but now look, any of you who may wish to change his way and join us in the journey to Iraq, so that means join us on the way to Karbala, okay, join us on this journey of standing firm against Yazid, he says, we shall pay off your travel fare. If you come with us, I'm going to pay your travel, and you will receive the best treatment from us. So he's telling these servants in the caravan, look, you come with us, you come with you in my journey, I will pay for your travel, and I will treat you well. Then, he says, if you want to leave, you know, if you want to go to Yazid, if you don't want to join us, he says, I will pay your travel for the distance that you have traveled to, which is up to here. So I will pay your journey up to me. What do we learn from this? What is the akhlaq of Hussein al-Islam? He's telling people, look, you can't do this, this is wrong, right? He's being very honest about it. But then he's saying, if you want to join me, I'm going to pay you, I'll look after you. But if you don't want to join me in my journey, no problem. I would, I'm still going to pay your travel fare up to this point. Even as you know, on the night of Ashura, he tells people, you can leave the tent. He is not saying, my way or the highway. He is not saying, look, you have to follow me. No, you're talking about saving Islam. And he has this mentality. And today, we are fighting over so many small things. I gave the example of the plead or different interpretation of Islam. And yet, Hussein al-Islam, on his mind, don't you think he's worried? He wants people to join him. And yet he's saying, look, you can go to Yazid, you can leave the tent, no problem. Because at the end of the day, you cannot force anyone to obey Allah or to do good. You can't. You cannot force any interpretation down someone's throat. Nobody will accept it. Nobody. So, my humble submission or conclusion is that when we talk about West and we say, oh, why are West saying that you are for, with me or against me? And they've used the statements, either you're with us or against us. I think George Bush has used this or other, other presidents. We also have to reflect, are we like this in our understanding of Islam? The religion of Hussein, the value of Hussein is one of mercy and giving and being part of his family. If we imagine and believe that Islam is one big family and we want everyone to be part of it, then inshallah we are closer to the message of Imam Hussein al-Islam. Jazakallah for your patience. I will now go to the maktab, inshallah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Yesterday, brothers and sisters, we reflected on how we must try to understand the brutalities that happened in Karbala. And we saw from the hadith that Hussein al-Islam was slaughtered like a sheep is slaughtered. And so were his family members. But there were other people who were killed in such brutal manners. And, that, and these were his messengers. And I want to relate to you the uh, maktal of Qais, Qais ibn Mushir. Qais ibn Mushir set off for Kufa on horse. However, Hussein ibn Numair and his troops arrested him. Qais was taken under escort to Ibn Ziyad. When he appeared in front of Ibn Ziyad, he put the letter of the Imam in his mouth and chewed it. Ibn Ziyad said, Who are you? Qais replied, I am from the Shia of Ali. Look at his courage, brothers and sisters. Ibn Ziyad demanded, Why did you chew that letter? Qais replied, 
so that you may not know what is written in it. Ibn Ziyad then asked him, who wrote the letter and for who was it intended? Qais answered, the letter was from Imam Hussain al-Islam for the people of Kufa, whose names I don't know. Ibn Ziyad became angry and ordered Qais, go up on the pulpit and denounce and curse Hussein, the lying son of a lying father. Astaghfirullah. How can anyone say this about our dear Hussein, who we love today and who Qais loved? Qais ascended the pulpit. But after praising Allah, he said, O oh people, Hussein is the best of Allah's creatures. He is the son of the dear Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. I have come as his messenger to you, and I have left him at Hajj. O oh people, answer his call for help and unite with him. After this case, cursed Ibn Ziyad, his father, and the Umayyads. And he prayed for Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, and Imam Hussein. And now at this point, we see the true brutality of Ibn, Zi Ibn Ziyad. Ibn Ziyad became angry. He commanded the executioners to take Qais to the roof of the palace and to kill him, but to kill him by pushing him to the ground. Qais was executed in this manner. Then his lifeless body was beheaded by one of the guards and he was just thrown to the ground. This is how the companions of Hussein al-Islam were treated. When we look at Karbala, we have to remember that even before that incident on the battlefield, there were other battlefields where people were beheaded and people's body was treated like dirt and was treated like a lifeless animal. When Hussein al-Islam heard about this, he started to cry and he said, to Allah we belong, and unto Him do we return. Indeed, Allah has granted Qais a place in paradise. And then He said, O oh Allah, grant our Shia a place close to You. Indeed, You are above all things powerful. When we look at the death of Qais, what do we think? We think of a man who sacrificed his life for Hussein Islam, who was not afraid to give up his body to give up his time to serve Hussein. And today, we want to serve Hussein al-Islam. Are we ready to sacrifice our time? Are we ready, whatever happens to us, that we can be like Qais, and we can praise the Ahlul Bayt al-Islam. May Allah elevate the station of all the shuhada. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raj'un.